Right. Um, I first saw Pink Floyd during the Christmas break in 1966 um, at the UFO Club in London. I have to tell you, it was a great club. Sid Barrett was on guitar at the time. Astonishing. The whole band were wonderful, just wonderful. Uh, Roger Waters had the most extraordinary, in, impressive presence, and their sound was swirling and cosmic and enveloping. But you could dance to them, and that's quite, quite, quite a big thing in the, in the psychedelic era, because you had to dance like this. <laughs> and um, Pink Floyd, a Pink Floyd gig, is the only reason that I've ever missed a Who show, period apart from car crashes or serious illness. And on January the 20th, 1967, I skipped a Who gig in Morecambe to take the famous Eric Clapton to see this guy, Sid Barrett, play guitar with Pink Floyd. And uh, on another occasion, I went all the way to Los Angeles to, see, to take Nick Rogue, the film director, to see The Wall. Uh, and it was on an extension on the 13th of February 1980. And in the event, Nick Rogue had gone back to London. And I, instead, I took his wife, the very glamorous actress, Teresa Russell. Uh, it was one of the greatest nights of my life, but Nick never forgave me. And we were supposed to be working on a film at the time, and that was cancelled. But uh, Nick and Teresa went on to have a happy marriage and lots of lovely children. And, and so I didn't interfere as much as I would have liked to. The wall sitting next to such a beautiful woman, watching the wall come down from 400 yards away, I didn't have very good seats, was amazing. <laughs> Hearing Dave Gilmore play and sing comfortably numb, while I was comfortably numb, was like landing in heaven. It was an extraordinary performance to see and an extraordinary show. And the next morning wasn't so good, pretty young over. This year at Live 8, I watched delighted that Roger Waters was back in the band again. I mean, I never ever thought it would happen. And another wall came down, I think. The wall between Dave and the other guys in the band and Roger. It was a, a, a great, fantastic moment for all of us who are friends of them all. And I've never chosen to try to understand what makes splintering bands splinter in the first place. And together again, they triumphed. I think you'll all agree. They marked a great day with some humility and some perspective. And uh, from the moon, the UFO club, the world, the universe, four lovely English chaps and a lost genius called Sid, I give you Pink Floyd. Why has it all got to be so terribly loud? That's the way we like it. When the first list was being drawn up in the rock and roll book of Genesis, it would have been, in the beginning, God created Pink Floyd. Arnold Lane. Arnold Lane. Arnold Lane. The things that they've touched were such high watermarks that no one's really even come close since. They've written stonkers. You know, you'd slit your bloody wrist to write some of them, you know. That's a fucking great band. More than being a band, Pink Floyd was a kind of feeling, a vibe, and, and an ethos. It's good alienation music, good pot smoking, you know. Nobody understands me, sort of dark, heavy music, you know, and I loved it. They were experimenting with lights and sound 30 years before what's happening now. Their visual show was a forerunner to what now a huge acid house party would be. You know you're going to get a great show and it's going to be great visual, uh, spectacular, as well as the music, so it's like sound and vision. The personality kind of was the multimedia of the whole thing, the music and the lights and stuff. Pink Floyd was faceless and lacked any individual human personality, but had a kind of aggregate personality. They didn't use their, their looks to sell records. They, 
didn't use a fashion to sell their records, they used music to sell their records. Dark Side of the Moon is sort of like the Mona Lisa. It's a masterpiece of production. The lyrics are fantastic. The playing is incredible. The musical sense at the center of this record is so thrilling and so new. It's like a thousand ideas crammed into this sort of one spot. It is a complete masterpiece. It really is. Put it on now, it'll stand on. so magisterial and perfect, like they just landed in a time capsule. The side stage was rammed with people to be there at that moment with this great group rejoined. Behind this really massive, solid perfection was this wonderful emotional tale of these men who hadn't played together for so long. All your life will ever be Boy, were they good, eh? For me personally, Pink Floyd is the band that I reach for when I've completely lost hope in music. The grass was green. The light was bright. They will always continue to be an influence with both the music that they're making now, the music that they made in the early days. I think the secret to their longevity is hummable, memorable melodies played by great musicians in a refined and intelligent way. All in all, it's just a in the wall. They've played an astonishing part in the history of rock and roll. There will never be another Pink Floyd. Rick Wright on keyboards, Nick Mason on drums, Dave Gilmore, one of the greatest guitar players on the planet, Roger Waters, and the legendary lost Sid Barrett, Pink Floyd. Well, there's only two of us tonight. Rick's, um, I think he's in hospital. He's just had an eye operation, poor sausage. And, and Roger's opening his opera tomorrow night, I think, in Rome. I think he's, there he is. <laughs> <laughs> so, Scary. To which we wish him the best of luck. And, um, and to all the uh, passengers on this fabulous ride we've been on, um, including Sid, Roger, uh, Michael, Steve O'Rourke, Tony Howard, and all these other people that have slipped off our two of us at one point or another. Cheers to them too. Are we going to have a word from Roger? You can have one or even two or three or four. I confess I never felt like a passenger, but notwithstanding that, uh, I'm sorry I can't be here, uh, there tonight. Um, all those eulogies were rather unnerving, but I have to say very touching. And uh, the response that we've had over the years from our public is, is very moving, and not least when we were all together that day in July uh, this year, uh, which was a fantastic uh, for us. And. Um, um, to, to revisit it then and seeing those scenes from it reminded me of, uh, of how great that was all to be together again. Rick actually hasn't had an eye operation. He and I have
eloped to Rome and were living happily in a small apartment off the Via Venuti. But uh, be that as it may, I thank you very much for this. It means a lot to me, and, and thank you very much, everybody. And thank you for me as well. It's, uh, can I have a go with yes. it? Yeah, it's, it's something to make up for <laughs> nearly 40 years of having to listen to bad drummer jokes, I think. <laughs> Although there is just one that I actually heard today that I thought, yeah, actually that sort of sums it up really. It's the small boy who says to his mother, when I grow up, I'm going to be a drummer. His, his mother laughs and looks at him pityingly and says, you can't do both.